is a good Sunday. Happy Team Sunday. Does anybody like the ducks? All right, three people. I had I had grief from all my friends today at church, that all the Huskies and Cougars, and I had one little kid who walks up to me and go, he goes, I like the ducks. And I'm like, you're like Jesus to me right now, kid. Way to go. So, uh, but come on on uh, NFL, our Hawks won again today, so that's good news. And just so you know, after service, we're going to do this as an annual event on Team Sunday. We've got all the NFL team logos on a big, huge banner out front. You might have seen it if you walked in. When you go outside, just to the left, and we've got uh, felt tip um, permanent markers, sign your name by your team. And so we'll keep that as our 2019 banner for Team Sunday, and it's going to be good. Also, how many of you were here last weekend? Were you here for a small group Sunday? That was such a great week. If you missed it, I need to tell you this. We have had the, a record amount of people sign up for small groups. Like, it is ridiculous. It's been amazing. And uh, my sister just called me on the way to church, and she said they had their first small group. Packed house. People are loving it. If you want to be in a small group and you didn't get in one, uh, you can go on our website, newvintagechurch.com, and click the small group link. And you can sign up right there, and the leaders will text you back. You get the information days and times and everybody needs a small group of people so nobody fights alone. Come on. All right. So today is um, kind of one of our messages in our series on Get In The Game. And uh, it's great that uh, the, the logo and the theme fits for Team Sunday so well. And I, I want everybody in church to get in the game. I don't want you to be a spectator in life. I want you to, like, get in. And anybody can criticize, but it's the person who gets on the field, come on, gets out on the court, that does something. Those are the people who enjoy life. And in your Christian journey, I want you to not be a spectator. I want you to get in the game. I want you to step into that. And so we're going to talk through that. We've been talking about uh, the second chapter of Acts There's a a place in scripture where it talks about what the brand new believers did in life. And I think a lot of people that are new to faith or maybe just never read the Bible for themselves, they don't know what do you do as a Christian. A lot of people think Christianity is about what you don't do, but Christianity is about who you follow and what you do that he talked about. And so we're going to look at the Bible for that. And I loved when we were just singing at the top of our lungs today, and we're like, your love's so good, you, don't, you won't leave me here, or something similar to that. Your love's so good, they leave me. Do you, we remember that part? It was powerful. Uh, and that's why I preach and don't sing. But, uh, man, come on, God's love is so good that he won't leave us where we're at. He wants us to grow. And so today I'm going to give you kind of a two-for-one deal in my sermon today. Yeah, come on, somebody. I hope you gave extras tonight because two for one, come on. And uh, I'm going to give you two teams that you get to get on in God's plan. One uh, team is going to be the team of God's family, and I want to talk about that. And the second part of the message tonight, I'm going to talk about getting on new vintage church team, like how you do that, because it's a great way to live life being on a team. So let's look at the scripture In Acts chapter 2, just a couple sentences here, and it'll be on the screen. I'm going to read it out loud. Peter's words, Peter, one of the disciples preaching, Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sin, turn to God, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to stop with just those verses and those words. There's so much in that. We're unpacking a little bit more every week. But you need to understand something about Christianity uh, Christianity tonight. And that is this, that if you don't know anything or don't know very much about Christianity, what Peter said here are like the three biggest deals. Number one, if you really want to follow Jesus, you've got to repent or have a change of mind about how you think about Jesus and how you think about yourself and go, I'm going to turn away from my selfish sin I'm going to turn towards God. That's step one. Step two is to get baptized in water or like one of the most powerful movies of all time said, you need to get baptized, right? You know, and and you need that. And then you need to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit where Jesus' spirit lives in your life, guides you, speaks to you, directs you, goes, son, don't do that. Daughter, don't call him. You, that, you know that's the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. And like... Just let him guide you in becoming more like Jesus. And that, those three things are essentials. 
in the Christian faith. And so I want to plug into uh, a baptism here for just a minute. But let me just tell you a, a quick story. When I was back in uh, Vancouver, Washington, when uh, we were youth pastors, there was a young man who'd come into our youth group. And he, his family was really uh, quite messed up, uh, uh, just a really destroyed background, if you will. And he came in and he, he really gave his entire life over to Jesus. And it was transforming for him. And he got his life kind of on track, and it was a, a really great thing to watch over the few years. When he became a senior, his mom came to me and said, hey, uh, pastor, can you help my son get a job because he's turning 18, and he needs to, like, just kind of step up in life. And I said, yeah, we'll talk about that. So I remember we talked to him, and he didn't know how to get a job, and I said, this is how we do it. We're going to get you an interview with the place. And I knew a guy who worked at Safeway that was hiring and so I said, hey, would you ever want to work at Safeway? He goes, yeah, that'd be perfect, kind of close to my house. I said, great. I said, have you ever done an interview? He goes, no. I said, what kind of, do you have any nicer clothes? He was always wearing basketball shorts and a T-shirt. I said, do you have anything nicer for the interview? He said, no. So we took him down, bought him Old Navy khakis, come on, and a white button-up shirt. And, a, and I said, this is a B-E-L-T. It's a belt. You're going to wear this. And he's like, all right. And so I coached him through it, spent a lot of effort, and had invested several years in this kid anyway. He goes to the interview, and he comes back, and I asked him the next day, I said, hey, how did it go? And he says, I didn't get the job. And I said, what do you mean you didn't get the job? I'm thinking, I know the behind-the-scenes thing. And he goes, no, I don't know what happened. I just, I didn't work out and kind of disappointed or whatever. So then I called my buddy over to Safeway. I said, hey, what happened to my boy that I sent over? Like, what? And he goes, he goes, man, I got to tell you the truth. This kid kind of threw the interview. He didn't answer the questions right. He wouldn't look me in the eyes. He was kind of rude. He was making jokes. And he, it was like he intentionally didn't want to get the job. So I'm like, oh, man. So out of being the, a great pastor that I am and showing this kid Christian love and gentleness for all these years, I get him back in my office and says, what did you do? I set this all up. I bought you those khaki pants. And I was mad. And I, I said, what's going on? And as I pressed this kid for what happened, here's what he said to me. He goes, he goes the reality is, he goes, I, I, and he starts crying, six foot three, big guy. He goes, I don't know how to run a cash register. I don't know how to do those buttons. And I said, you know that the first several weeks they actually train you and they show you how. They're not going to let your Safeway money go flying out the door. And he goes, I didn't know that. And I was like, oh, he didn't know what was coming. And, you know, in being a pastor, I've had some young men come into my office and, man, they get their first date with a, a, a good Christian girl and they're going to go to some nice place for dinner, and it's their first date, and the guy bails out because he didn't know how to tie a tie, and I'm thinking, bro, this was maybe your only chance at love, you know, and <laughs> didn't know how to do it, and you know, I've had people like in their Christian faith actually be like, man, I want to, I love who Jesus is, but I don't think I can do the whole church thing, I just, I'm not that good of a person, and, and, and I don't know what to do next, and I just want to tell you tonight, that we're going to go back to basics in this series because you need to know what is the next step coming your way. God is, is so in love with you that he doesn't want to leave you where you're at. And inside your heart, I know this. I know that you want to grow in him. You want to go from being a believer to becoming a disciple where God begins to work in your life. And the next step for you, if you've never done that, is to be baptized. All right? So it's going to be good. Here is one of the things I was thinking about when it comes to baptism, I actually uh, shifting gears in my mind, but I was thinking about how high school athletes sign up and get on a college uh, athletics program, and there's a, an actual process, and I, I like to geek out, so I read about some of this stuff, and it kind of looks like these three bubbles here, but the first step is you got to apply to the college and, and actually get your, you know, transcripts over and all of that and get accepted. Then there's an offer of a scholarship, which is where the college is going to give the student something great, better than they deserve usually. And then they sign the national letter of intent. And when they do that, when, when a student signs that, that's a legally binding document. And it says that they're committed to this school and no other school can recruit them. They are now spoken for. And I was, uh, as I was looking at that and reading about that, I thought it's a little bit like how it is in our faith in our journey with Jesus, it's kind of like when you apply, like you maybe go to church and you decide, man, I'm going to follow Jesus, and you're interested in that, and you apply, and you put your faith in Jesus, that's that next step, and maybe you can click that forward for me, but that would be uh, salvation, and then all of a sudden, God begins to pour out his promises in your life, 
begins to like touch your life with scriptures and the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. And it's almost like getting the scholarship. And then the letter of intent, the equivalent would be getting in the baptism tank and going, I'm making this legit. Like this is where God uh, actually puts his endorsement on you and goes, Nobody else can recruit you. You're mine. You're on my team. When Jesus got baptized, what happened is it was not just like joining the team. It was actually deeper than that. It was relationship. The voice of God the Father actually speaks out of heaven and goes, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen, when you get baptized, it's not just signing up for a team, getting a jersey. It's deeper than that. You get in God's family. Like he goes, no, you're mine. And it's like your last name is getting changed. You got adopted, and nothing can change that. And it's so awesome. I think there's something in all of us that, like, wants to be on a cool team. Like, we all want to be on a team. And uh, thank yeah, amen. Come on. I like these boys right here tonight. I'm just going to give you a little extra loving on the, in the sermon s- something. I don't know, even know what I'm talking about right now. But uh, when I was a kid, I, I wanted to, I was going to junior high. And let me just ask you this. How many of you have really bad memories from junior high? Anybody have a bad memory from junior high? Yeah. And if you need therapy, there's, maybe, you know, just grab somebody's hand right now. But uh, it was tough for me. And I wanted to join the basketball uh, team because I liked basketball, but I wasn't that good. I had shot baskets at the corner hoop uh, on our block. And that was it. I got a picture, found a picture of me growing up playing basketball and uh, <laughs> come on, somebody. That's, that's actually not me, but I just like that big style. It's funny. Um, but the other part of it, the words up there, that's true. I was a starter for the, for the B team. Yeah, and uh, here's how that goes. So I go to the tryouts, and uh, I'm already at a couple. I got a couple disadvantages. Now, you can't tell right now, but back in the day, I was not that athletic. <laughs> <laughs> and so you need to hear this story. So I get on the, on the court, and, and, and I grew up in a nice family, and my parents talked kindly to me, and this coach is yelling at me. And I'm like, dude, I'm trying to help your team. And he's yelling at me, and I'm like starting to cry. And he's like, stop it. And I'm like, don't yell at me. It made it worse, and I'm just like it was bad. And then the coach also had twin sons that were – in the same grade as me, trying out for the team. These were like the spawn of Satan, these two boys. They were awful. And so I'm already, there's two spots missing on the team. You know they're going to make the team, and that was a bad thing. And then, then we're doing um, some drills, and I'm trying, again, this is tryouts. And so we're, we're, we're doing like uh, layups, but we're doing the kind where you run down the whole court, and you pass the ball, the free throw line, they pass it back, pass it to the half court, pass it back, pass it to the other free th- throw person, They pass it to you, and you lay it up. And I'm like, I can do this. You're not supposed to dribble, which was good for me because dribbling was not my strong suit. And so right as I go up for the last one, and the coach is standing right there, one of the twin sons of Satan throws the ball, not right at my hands, but on purpose, like really hard, line drives it right to my face. The ball punches me, and I go off into the corner, and I'm crying. And the coach yells my name, Malt, no crying. And I'm like, stop it. You know, and I'm like, this is just an awful scenario. We go to do these other drills, and I did something that is nearly physically <laughs> impossible to do. It's this weird phenomenon. I went up for the lay-in, and the ball, it's, it's so hard to do. You can't even find this on YouTube, I don't think. The ball, like, wedges between the rim and the backboard. And just sticks there. And the problem is we were kind of a poor school. And that was the one basketball we had. All these junior high kids, big fat coach, and nobody can jump up there and get the ball. Malt! And I'm just like, I don't want to do this, you know. And one of the times we're doing defensive drills and the coach is yelling at me. He knew my name. And he's yelling at me. And he's like, we're doing zone. Get in the zone. And I didn't know the language. So I, I, I'm like, okay. Like, I have, I'm trying to get in the zone. Anyway, uh, I made the B team, and I started some of those games, and I'm proud of that. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. I, I'm, I tell you that story because it's painful for me, and it feels good sharing it, but also because there's something in us that wants to be on a team. And can I tell you that with, with God, with your, your journey in faith, there's no tryouts, Like, we don't even, like, God is doing the work recruiting us. 
he's going, I want you on my team. Like he would, he, he, he would take us first round starter on every team. Like he chooses us. He goes, I'll take you. I'll work with what you give me. He goes, you give me your, your whole heart, all your effort, and we're going to get you on this team. I'm telling you that if you want to be on God's team, don't just be a believer. Do the first thing that Jesus taught us to do and get baptized. Come on. Get in the tank and, and do that. It's what he wants. One of the things that's really interesting in the Bible, and actually in Bible times, if you go back to the time of Jesus, uh, if you wanted to travel anywhere far, you would go by boat because they didn't have, you know, cars and all that. And so ships were not made like they are today. They were old and they would, uh, you know, old fashioned in the way that they were built and they would leak and eventually they would uh, be unrepairable. And so what would happen is when a boat would get so far gone that they actually couldn't do any more repairs to it, they would have to get rid of that boat, which was a huge investment for the people who owned the boat, but they would have to get rid of it. And these big, large structures, they couldn't bring it onto the land. So they would actually tie a rope to the old boat that's now no longer good for anything, tie it to a brand new boat. The brand new boat would take it out to the middle of the sea, and they would actually then throw some weights in it and burn that boat and sink that boat to the bottom of the lake or the bottom of the ocean. And the Greeks would use a word for that process, and the word they used was in Greek called baptizo. They would actually baptizo that thing and sink that old ship all the way to never be used again. And I'm telling you, when you get baptized, Jesus adopts that word and goes, hey, it's like this. You're in this boat that's sinking. You got holes in it, and it's no good anymore. And we're going to drag that out thing, that old thing out, and we're going to sink it, and we're going to forget all the mistakes you've made, and I'm going to cast it as far away, all your sin from the east to the west, and that old life isn't going to get better or repaired again. We're going to sink it, and all you people that were in that old boat are getting in the brand new boat that I provide. That's what baptism does for you. Baptism isn't you getting better. It's you going from death to life, resurrection life specifically. And so we need that. We need to do that. So, man, I just I want to ask you the same question that that movie asked. Come on, Nacho. Like, why have you not been baptized? You know, and like, you know, seriously, like, why not? You know, let me tell you um, or ask you this question. We're doing as a church family, and you can jump on at any point, but is anybody in here doing our daily Bible reading plan called the Get in the Game Bible reading plan? Come on. Yes. Awesome. A lot of you. And if you haven't done it, you can find it on our uh, social media and our website. And we're reading a chapter of the Bible every day together as a church, and it's been really cool. Today, when I drive into church, I get here early, and I'm in the parking lot, and I'm doing my Bible reading, not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a Christ follower just like you, and I'm reading the Bible, and it's in Acts chapter 22 today, and as I'm reading this, there's a part of the story where Paul, the apostle, one of the disciples that ends up changing the world, he's actually on trial, and in fact, this guy, this brother was in trouble everywhere he went, but he's in on trial right now, and he's trying to explain what happened to his life, and as he's explaining it to the court, one of the things that he does is he tells the moment about when he encounters Jesus who shows up on the road for him. And it's so amazing. He hears Jesus speaking to him and it blinds him. And he says, I ended up hearing God's voice tell me, go to Ananias' house. So he goes to this brother's house named Ananias. Ananias sees him three days later and goes, brother Saul, let your eyesight return in the name of Jesus right now. Instantly healed. And he has this conversation. And then here's the line that I read this morning from Acts 22. Ananias says to Paul, and he's only been like a believer in Jesus for a couple days. He says, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. And listen, you don't have to go to Bible college. You don't have to know everything there is about it. You, I want to ask you the same question that Ananias asked Paul. What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and let God's work. Some of us in our life feel like, I don't know, I'm trying this Christianity thing out. I don't know if it's working that well. Uh, You ain't working it. God's got real simple steps, and step one is get baptized. I'm telling you, you begin to obey Jesus in your life with the simple things, big things are going to happen for you. And I, I just am excited about that for you. Here's how you can get baptized at New Vintage Church. We do a thing called Connect Class. It runs every Sunday, every single Sunday, except for today. It didn't run today. 
because today's an odd thing on the, on the calendar. We, only, we have five Sundays in the month of September. And so we uh, do, it's four classes, and it just kind of runs back to back. The first Sunday of the month, which is next Sunday, is class number one. And in class number one, one of the things that they talk about is how to be, uh, or what the scripture teaches about baptism. And we want people to take that class. And then two weeks from tonight, if you haven't, if you go to that next week, you can get baptized. And I'm pointing over here because that's where the tank's going to be. You can get baptized in two weeks. And you got your family and your friends and your church family be here cheering you on as you take that step. And it's going to be amazing. And so I encourage you to do that. The Connect class happens literally an hour before the service starts. So we start at 7, some of you 7.12 or 7.15, whatever. And But the class starts at 6 o'clock, or is it, Jeff? 5.45, thank you, my friend. And we feed you dinner, and it's free, and just get here and get baptized. That's how you get on God's team. Are you all with me so far? Yeah. All right, I'm going to shift gears now in your two-for-one lightning round. How you get on new vintage team. Are you ready for this? You feeling good? You still love me even though I'm wearing an Oregon Ducks shirt? Thank you. Okay, God is with you. I want to read you a story in Acts. I want you to see what happens as God is building his church. But it's a couple chapters down the road, a couple weeks or months maybe after uh, what we've been reading in Acts 2. It's in Acts chapter 6. And I want you to follow along with this Bible story as I read this. As the believers rapidly multiplied, come on, the church is growing, there was rumblings of discontent. That sounds like modern church world. <laughs> All right, the church grows and there's discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, and they said that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 called a meeting of all the believers, the Hebrew speakers and the Greek speakers, and they said, hey, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And the apostles were not trying to say, hey, we're better than you. What they were saying is, we know specifically what God called us to, and we're having a hard time doing that and this. And so they said, so brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and who are full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and in teaching the word. Everybody liked this idea, so they chose the following people. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And let me just tell you about Stephen for a second. You might go, man, it doesn't sound really awesome, like getting chosen to be like helping to pass out food to old ladies. But I'm telling you that these guys actually did miracles, like God's Spirit came on them in it. Stephen actually has incredible things happen in his life. And even in his early death, when they are murdering him for following Jesus, it was a turning point in another man's life named Paul who wrote most of the New Testament. And I'm telling you, when you do anything for God, even if it's giving out food for free to people, if you do it in faith and in serving Jesus, God turns that into something amazing in life. And so they choose uh, Stephen and Philip. And Philip has crazy awesome stories throughout the book of Acts. And then a guy named Procurus, which is an awesome online name if you need one. That's just sounds cool and uh, for, like, gaming. And then Nick Canor and, and then Timon, which apparently is Puma's, Pumba's partner and, you know, Hakuna Matata, everybody. And the Paramin, this other guy, and Nicholas. And the seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them, laid their hands on them. And so God's message, check this out, God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased. I want you to see how these two things tie together. One is they gave responsibility away, and then the numbers of believers greatly increased. They gave responsibility to the church people, and the numbers greatly increased. And I'm telling you that if, if we can get a vision to, to not just cheer on what we believe God is asking us to do and be as a church family for the Tri-Cities, but if we actually want to see a great number of people come to know Jesus, then as a church team, we've got to give responsibility away and go, hey, we need somebody in the coffee booth. We need somebody to help in the kids' ministry. Would you show up and maybe help run sound or push the buttons for the screen? And I'm telling you, as we give responsibility to everybody, then the church will massively grow. It's just the way that God works. And, and sometimes in our mind, we go, I, I feel like I got this big dream. I don't want to just like sweep or hold the door like I went to college. Well, listen, I, that's not the attitude that Jesus had. If you can just go, I'll do whatever it takes for the team, for Team Jesus, 
then God can work miracles in that. And I put up, uh, I want you to see this picture. So you, you might be like the food delivery people in the Bible. You might be a spirit-filled Uber Eats person. But if you put some faith in Jesus and go, God, go with me where I go to work with everybody I'm handing the food to, I'm telling you that God can do something with that. doesn't matter. And in the small green letters here, it says small things, big impact. Sometimes we think that if we're doing these little things, like it doesn't matter. It does matter. It adds up and it has impact. And uh, there was a, a great thing that happened. You know, we had people on teams at our church because of that. People invited people, and this lady comes to church in February, and she ends up praying with us to start following Jesus, and her life gets turned around, and she'd never been to church before, and she loves it. She sits at the 9 a.m. service in the first or second row. She gets as close as she can every Sunday, and man, when they're singing about the goodness of God, she's got her hands lifted, and she's just crying, thinking about how good God has been to her life from February, and she's in here, and she gets in a small group and starts to meet some friends. And then she goes to Connect class and gets on a team with NVC, and she's serving coffee this morning. As I get here early, I go in to get some coffee, and I said to her, I said, hey, do you like making the coffee? You have to get here so early. She goes, I love it. And I said, come on, that's awesome. And she might not think that what she's doing is a big deal, but it's a big deal because Pastor Matt needs some coffee, somebody. Come on with that. But not just that, but listen, People are coming into church. I met probably 10 families in the first two services, first Sunday here. And for them that are nervous, there was a guy came into the first service. I can't even describe to you. Like, I, I, I don't feel at liberty to tell you, but there's, like, things in his life. And he, and, and he ends up coming in, and he was nervous. He'd never been to church before. And somebody said, hey, there's free coffee. And he went to go grab a cup of coffee because it kind of calmed him down. He's like, okay. And, and so he comes in, and, and we got to pray with that young man today. And he gave his heart over to Jesus, and he's talking to me in the parking lot about how he wants to start reading the Bible. He wants all that God has. He goes, I want to volunteer. I want to make a difference. I want God to change my life. And I'm like, you know why that happened? It wasn't because of a preacher. It's because somebody's serving coffee. Somebody's doing kids' ministry so their kids can be helped. It's somebody greeting them at the front door. Those small things matter. So you got to see it like with eternal eyes. Are you all with me so far? I, I think that uh, doing the small things has big impact. D.L. Moody, a preacher from way back, like in the last century, he said this great quote. He said, there are many of us that are willing to do the great things for the Lord, but few of us that are willing to do the little things. And man, listen, you can get stuck in your mind going, well, I got this dream about I'm going to write this album or I'm going to preach to thousands or I'm going to, and I'm like, man, just show up for church. Why don't you start there? Why don't you like be on time helping the kids class? And, and if you, you think you're going to make it, but you're sloppy and lazy now, you ain't going to be able to handle the success that you're dreaming about. And if you want to make it big, why don't you start like God does with all of us and start small because it's those small things that add up to be big. And if it's for Jesus, there's nothing small, man. I, I uh, love that. Come on. I was reading, uh, again, sometimes I find these threads and I just kind of go down the rabbit trail in my studies and I was thinking about how our world economy, like, and especially in, in the Western world, has shifted and changed. And if you think about, about this, like, uh, because of the iPhone and then because of the internet and because of, like, Amazon, like, like, literally you can order your vitamins or a T-shirt or anything, it gets there the next day. And if it's like there in two days, we're mad, right? But like you can get stuff from anywhere. And so there's been a huge increase in like places like UPS, FedEx, United Postal Service for delivery of these goods. Like people don't even shop anymore. Malls are starting to close down. Like the world economy is like shifting around. Part of that has to do with there's not as many crafts anymore. Like, like you, there's not like guys sitting in their, in their garage like, like, you know, shaving wood and building a table. Like, that's kind of rare. And so there, there's like, like these crafts are down. And so consequently, apprenticeships in America are on the decline. And they have been for a long time. In fact, apprenticeships of the traditional trades are down so much that in 2015, Obama approved uh, $175 million to help companies fund uh, apprenticeship programs. And then Trump actually increased that in his administration because it's been on the decline. One dude I was reading about, he said in his studies that he saw the decline in apprenticeships start 
in the year 1815 is when they started to go down. And I was just going, wow, this is incredible. And so, you know, our world has changed where we don't even have like these master craftsmen as many anymore. It's a lot more rare. And I was thinking about Christianity and I was like, God, we need to be apprenticed. Like we need somebody to tell us how to get the job, how to tie the tie. How, what's the next step to get baptized? Even though apprenticeships in America are on the decline, I'm telling you in the church they're on the incline. And if you want to like grow in your faith, we're open for apprenticeship business. And, and I had a friend after the first service stop me and he goes, hey, do you know that apprenticeship, like the whole word and origin of that started with Jewish rabbis where, and the word was translated to disciple. Listen, if you want to grow in your faith and be an apprentice of what Jesus is doing, you got to become a disciple and keep taking steps in Jesus's footsteps and do what he did. Ed Stetzer, who does these massive studies for the church, he's like a, he geeks out on numbers and and surveys and stuff, and he had this uh, great, I saw this video, and he was speaking at this really important conference about how churches in America have been on the decline, but there's churches on the, in America that are on the incline, and he studied those. He wanted to know what was causing churches that were growing, what were they doing? One of the common threads was they had a strong, robust discipleship program where they're teaching people the next steps to do in their faith. And of all the things that were the key elements of 4,000 churches they studied for a while, there was eight key elements. But he said the one thing that we found in this multi-year 4,000 church study was that if you can get a Christian to serve, all the other elements begin to fall in line. That was the common thread. And, I wanna, and he said this way. He goes, I want to say that if you want people to grow in their spiritual life, get them serving. And I was just, my mind was going, this is incredible. If you go, man, I just feel like I, I'm not growing. Maybe you're not serving. And maybe you, could, if you, maybe you could turn it on its head and go, maybe I should start serving and watch God start growing in me. And that's how it happens. I, can I just be frank and honest with you? My name's not Frank, but I'm going to be honest with you. I, our Sunday 7 p.m. service is probably my I love this. That's for real. I'm buttering you up for something. Get ready to get punched. <laughs> where we're weakest in our 7 p.m. service is we're weakest in people coming here that love coming here but also want to serve here. And in the other services, I got a higher percentage. And I go, not my 7 p.m. people. I'm going to get them on board. Because, listen, some people go to church almost their whole life and never help lift. And I just want to go, bro, do you even lift? And I'm like, you need to get on a team and help us lift the bird. You need to pour some coffee once a month. You need to hold the door once a month. There are people that show up that have professional jobs and are great people that are watching the kids right now. And they do that once a month. And they, and they come and they actually already came to church today. But they're coming because they wanted you to experience Jesus tonight. And can I just say that all of us got to where we are because somebody else cared about us more than themselves. And if you want to see God move in your life, you need to invest some time in caring for other people more than you care about yourself. And you watch God grow in your life. You need to get in the game. You need to get on a team around here. Come on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let me, let me take this moment and transition it to one last kind of key thought here tonight. At the end of time, so at the end of time, Jesus is going to sit down on his throne. All the work will be done. And he's going to be the judge over every life, over every year and every century. And he's going to be the judge of humanity. And he's going to set all the wrongs to right. And in the kingdom of God is going to be perfect in the new heavens and the new earth. And this is one of the things about God. And Jesus began to speak to this. And as I was reading this, I was thinking, man, and I'm going to read it to you in a second. But I was thinking, this is Jesus' scorecard for humanity. So if we want to talk team for a second, I think it's important that we know how is Jesus going to score our lives at the end of, of it all. And, and this is what I was reading. And Jesus is preaching here. It's his own words. And he's talking about himself. And I want you to see this. When, when the Son of Man, Jesus is talking about himself, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels are with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence. 
and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. If you're in this section over here tonight, I'm sorry, you didn't make it. God bless you for coming. The, you're, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but that's what's going to happen. It says, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father and inherit the kingdom that's prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. This is Jesus talking now. As the king of the universe, the created world, created you know, universe, And he's saying, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then those righteous ones, the ones on the right, the sheep, not the goats, they will say, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or feed and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and showed you hospitality or naked and gave you clothing? When did we ever see you sick and in prison and come and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. And the scorecard for Jesus is not about what you know up here. The scorecard for Jesus is, Did you serve people that were hungry and thirsty and needed something that you could give to them? Did you actually spend some time giving away to somebody that needed some help? Did you go and pray for somebody who was sick? Did you give money to somebody who needed some money? Did you actually take care of other people around you? Did you serve other people? Jesus is the king, and he himself said, I did not come to be served. I came to serve. And if we're going to be a disciple and we're going to walk in his footsteps, man, you need to get baptized and know that you're on God's team and know that it's legit and it's sealed and you're his son, you're his daughter. But your next step is you got to serve and you got to go, man, I may not know much, but I'm going to show up and I'm going to help and start learning. I'm telling you, you'll grow and you'll be walking in the footsteps of Jesus in that way. Man, I, uh, uh, one last kind of story here as as I wind it down because I can hear the beautiful piano music. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, so it's almost time, we're almost done. When I was uh, in, I've only been in three churches really in my life as as an adult. From the time I was 14, 15 years old, I went to a church and Bob McGregor was my youth pastor and when he planted a church, we went with him to be in that church. I was church number two and then that church, him as my pastor sent us here. So like, like I'm just not, that's just a little bit about me. Anyway, when I was in Pastor Bob's church in Vancouver, Washington, I remember I had these big dreams about all this stuff that I wanted God to do with my life. And, you know, I prayed at times and been like, God, I just want to preach more. And I want to like, I want to preach at the Memorial Coliseum and, you know, thousands. Of, uh, and I had these dreams about just things. And, and I remember that. When, when the economy kind of tanked in 2006 and seven, we had to lay off some people at our church staff back then. And so then I ended up taking on a lot of uh, jobs that uh, I wasn't used to. They put me over the college and then the interns. They put me over the projector, uh, you know, computer for Sundays. And they put me over the um, ushers. And then I was also in charge of the parking lot team. And I had to take on the website and learn how to do graphics and website. The pastor then asked me if I would do all his PowerPoint slides and I'm, I'm just doing all this stuff. And I remember I'm sitting on a Saturday night church service and I'm sitting back there behind a computer pushing the buttons and going, this is not what I dreamed about when I signed up like for Bible college and told Jesus you can have my life. Like I had big dreams. And I remember just thinking about all these things I was doing going, this doesn't make sense. And I don't know if this is making a difference and it's a little frustrating. And it wasn't uh, very much longer after that that God began to just talk to Lisa and I about us starting a church. And as we go to start the church and we get out here, didn't really know anybody. And somebody goes, hey, you need a website. I'm like, oh, I think I know how to do that. And so I was able to do that. And they're like, hey, need to get the computers and stuff going. I go, oh, I could show somebody how to do that. And all this stuff. 
And all of the things that I did started paying off in my life. And it was like the old Karate Kid movie, like wax on, wax off. And I was just, my arms were getting tired. I'm like, this sucks, you know. But, but all of a sudden, when the enemy was coming at our church here, all of a sudden, I was like, wah, wah. You know, I like, I knew what to do. I hope you woke up right there. I'm telling you that, like, sometimes we look at small things in our life. And we're dreaming about the big things, but God goes, no, I'm, I want I want to do something incredible. You won't see it for a while, but in, I, I want to do something in the small things in your life. I don't know what it's going to be for you. You might be a spirit-filled coffee server here, spirit-filled children's worker. And you might be watching somebody's kid that comes for the first time down the road. They desperately needed God, and they came to church, and they had their kids, and they didn't want to leave them at home. They didn't even know we had child care. And they show up and they got, you know, all their kids, you know, strapped on all the little, you know, ones in a fanny pack and a backpack and a front pack. And, they're, and we're like, hey, we have somebody who God's changed their life. They're in there for you. Bring your kids back here. And you might be sitting back there going, I don't even know if this is mad. I'm telling you, it's making a difference. I don't know why God has chosen us to do this, but somehow just in the thing that's on our church we've seen between like 5 and 15 people pray with us to start a relationship with Jesus every weekend for the last several years and I don't even understand that I, it's hard for me to comprehend my own dad at Panera at lunch today my dad goes do you still get excited that people he goes it's, I can't believe people are raising their hand to pray to follow Jesus every weekend I go yeah dad I still get excited about that. And I'm telling you that I go, man, it's so awesome. I don't even remember why I was telling you this. I'm just emotionally a wreck right now. But I can tell you this. I'm glad that somebody served in a church a long time ago that I went to so I could find Jesus. And we got to take it and go, I don't want to just come to 7 p.m. service, get it in, check it off. I want you to come and make church happen. Invest and go, man, there's other people that need what we got. Ah, cool. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much for being here. God, uh, totally apart and separate from what I'm even speaking about tonight, I just know that your presence is here touching men and women tonight. And doing a deep work in people's lives. I can just tell, I can feel, and I can hear your spirit's voice and I can see what you're doing. And I thank you that you're touching lives. And God, there's a lot of people in this room that feel like almost shattered. But God, you're, the, you're, you're, you're like the glue that can put their life together. You're the peace in the middle of a storm. You're the savior for all of us who needed saving. And I just thank you that your presence is here to, to do your work tonight because you love humanity and you love people that are here. I'm gonna ask you to keep your eyes closed. I just wanna talk for a second with you, with you being in kind of an attitude, a moment of prayer. And I want to give you the same offer that somebody gave me. And to let you know the great news in life is that Jesus would take you on his team. First round, he, like he wants you. He has been longing for you. He actually created your life. And as human beings, if we can have the faith and the humility to say, Jesus, if you can rescue me, I need your rescuing. If you can take my messed up life and you can forgive it, make something out of it, would you do that? If you have that kind of faith and that kind of humility, Jesus responds to that in a moment. He'll step into your life and begin to change your life. It's an incredible, incredible thing. And I want to pray with people tonight that I, I don't know everybody's story here. I don't know what you're going through, but I, I do know this, that just people go through things. And if you came into church tonight and you're just far away from Jesus, there's no, no Jesus in your life. Man, I'm telling you, he wants to step in if you will allow him and, and invite him into that. Everybody's got their eyes closed in here. But if 
that's you and you go, Pastor, I want in on that prayer that you're going to pray for that. I want to start following Jesus tonight. I want you to be super brave and I want you to stick your hands straight up in the air right where you're at right now because I'm going to pray with you. Come on. Thank you, my friend. That's awesome. Thank you, my friend. Come on. Thank you. Come on. Thank you. It's so awesome. Come on. Thanks, my man. Y'all can put your hands down. I, I, I'm crying because I just know that God is just like, he's just changing people. Like it's so much bigger than a sermon or anything. Like it's like God's presence. He just loves you so much. Like he's gonna, we're gonna pray in a second. He's just gonna step into your life and you're gonna feel the, the forgiveness of God and you're gonna feel the presence of God. You're gonna start to feel even like a little bit of transformation. Like man, God's already working in my life. He's that good. I want everybody, the whole church, going to pray with these five or six people. Will you all do that with me? I'll pray out loud. Could you say yes if you want to do it? All right, I just need to know. And when we pray, I want you to pray that louder, louder. Come on, we're going to, this is an incredible moment for our friends. Let's all pray this. Jesus, I come to you in prayer. I'm putting my trust in you. I ask you to forgive me. Every mistake I've made in life, Give me a brand new start in this moment. I don't want to be better. I want to be alive in you. Jesus, fill me tonight. I'm going to follow you for the rest of my life. I commit to that right now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Come on, say amen. Would you stand up and let's sing to celebrate together with our friends tonight.